for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. Since I recently retired from Sri Chitra and I'll be showing some of the videos and the data from uh, my previous institute, let me first of all uh, acknowledge that uh, these videos are actually taken from the Madhav Nair Center of uh, Comprehensive Epilepsy Care, which I was heading recently. I thought uh, the best way to possibly introduce a subject would be to show you some illustrative cases which I have come across during the last uh, nearly 10 years. And the reasons for that is one is that uh, these kind of illustrative cases can possibly teach you much more than what 10 slides could convey to you. And second reason is uh, that some of these videos are quite dramatic so that in the post lunch session if somebody is tending to sleep you may be waken up by means of the dramaticity of the videos. The first case is a five year old girl was brought by her parents with the complaints that frequent awakening from sleep. They told that she has got the whole night's sleep is disturbed, not only that she is disturbed by herself, but she disturbs the mother's sleep also. And possibly because of that she has got daytime sleepiness and poor performance at the school. Otherwise she was a child with a normal birth and development. She already carried an MRI which was done outside. These days you, the first thing you do is an MRI before examining the patient. Maybe because of that she already had an MRI which was reported to be normal and we reviewed it, it was normal. Now I'll show you some of the two events which we have recorded. After the face is covered because of uh, to keep the confidentiality of the patient, she just wakes up and is restless, looking here and there, and then goes back to sleep. Nothing more dramatic is happening. One more event. Okay, that's also again almost the same, that she wakes up and seems to be transiently confused which lasts for a few seconds and goes back to sleep. This happened several times during the night. So initially we thought that she may be having some dreams or maybe periodic awakening due to whatever other reason is. But during the video EG monitoring, as those of you who are not familiar with the EG, what it shows is a rhythmic activity coming over the the left temporal region and this is a kind of ictal activity which is synchronized with these awakening episodes. And some of those were also associated with this kind of rhythmic spikes, what we call as the, the multiples of spikes which are happening over the frontotemporal region. So here what we have demonstrated is a periodic awakening due to epileptic attacks. This is what you call the epileptic arousals which are occurring in this child. And she was treated with uh, benzodiazepines as a single dose at bedtime, which actually produced a dramatic improvement in her cognitive performance, scholastic performance in those schools, and these episodes also stopped subsequently. The second patient is a 35-year-old female. She has almost got a daily nocturnal stereotyped event since the age of 10 years. These events which I am going to show you but they were history wise characterized by vocalization, abrupt onset along with postering of the one upper limb with occasional urinary incontinence associated with it. During the last this 25 years she never had a, any daytime attacks when she was awake. Always it happened during sleep. She has been treated with multiple anti-epileptic drugs without any response and because of these reasons a referral diagnosis was to exclude a non-epileptic events for which she underwent a video EG monitoring at the Madhunai Center. This is one of her events which is recorded.
as you can see that this abruptly an onset associated with howling and there is an asymmetric posturing of the right upper limb which is more dystonically postured and since she quickly recovers and the nurse is trying to ask her a name to which she responds the total episode lasted for less than 1 minute maybe about 30 to 40 seconds only and this is a eeg during the episode as expected because of the motor movement it is largely obscured but indirectly these are those who are not again familiar with eeg these are the spikes which are the markers of epilepsy and they were coming from the left frontal region and the mri showed this lesion which is located over the left frontal region this is what you call a focal cortical dysplasia so she has got a symptomatic localization related epilepsy with the left frontal cortical dysplasia which was only occurring exclusively during sleep for 20 to 25 years because of that reason this diagnosis was missed and the third patient is a 49 year old male who has got history of multiple episodes of febrile seizure during very early childhood but the recurrent nocturnal events started from the age of 35 years the semiology is characterized by a abrupt loud vocalization restlessness and during which he might hit other persons nearby usually his wife frequency of episodes are about 3 to 4 per night and never had any daytime episodes and no response to different anti epileptic drugs the mri was normal here the differential diagnosis would be between a parasomnia and a nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy with this kind of presentation that's what clinically one should be suspecting i'll just show you two of the recorded episodes second one is perhaps more dramatic immediately regains consciousness you, and you. could talk to the talk to the nurse thank you thank you and this patient's eeg if you carefully see that is so characterized by these tiny spikes which are occurring over the the left frontal region this is indirectly in between the attacks and during the ictus or during the activity this became more frequent and just preceding this episode which is obscured by the myogenic artifacts you can see those rhythmic ictal activity which is building up over the left frontal region this patient's mri was normal so this is an example of what you call nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy which again has to be distinguished from parasomnias so the relationship between sleep and epilepsy has been known since antiquity and the suspicion was established by the discovery of the electroencephalogram during the 1920s by hans berger where you could find a correlation between whatever is happening initially by history and subsequently by the video eeg which i showed you and correlating it with the electroencephalographic activity during the episodes that means synchronized recording of the video and eeg is ultimately the definite proof that these are either related to epilepsy or not related to epilepsy so the interrelationship between sleep and epilepsy is bidirectional that means sleep can 
influence epilepsy, which I am going to show you by various ways. And similarly, epilepsy can also influence the sleep. Let us see how this, what all ways this can occur. The, it has been well known that both sleep as well as the sleep deprivation can potentiate or activate the interictal epileptiform abnormalities in the EEG. And similarly, epileptic seizures can also occur more frequently during sleep. There are few epileptic syndromes in which seizures occur almost exclusively only during sleep. And uh, there are also various sleep disorders which can influence the sleep which we will examine. And similarly, the anti-epileptic medications, some of them are sedative, can also influence the sleep. And as we have shown in the last case, the diagnosis between parasomnias and the seizures are important to establish in order to manage these patients in uh, those patients presenting exclusively with events only during sleep. Now there is a difference between what can happen to the, the both interictal as well as ictal activity between the non-REM and the REM sleep. Dr. Mohan Kumar has showed you the physiological aspect of the REM and the non-REM sleep. By and large, the non-REM sleep is a potentiator or activator of various things which are happening in epilepsy. By contrast, the REM sleep is an inhibitor. Because of that reason, there is a synchronization of the EEG during non-REM sleep, why they get desynchronized during the REM sleep. The indirectal epileptiform abnormalities which becomes more frequent, more become more generalized during the non-REM sleep, while they become less frequent and more localized in, during the REM sleep. And uh, there is also increased likelihood of seizures getting potentiated during the non-REM sleep while it is the other way around in REM sleep. In fact, the REM sleep, the epileptic act of the seizures occur much less frequently than during even the daytime. Now, there are few epileptic syndromes in which the influence of sleep is much more marked. For example, the benign epilepsy with central temporal spikes, or it's also called benign Rolandic epilepsy, or Landau-Cleffner syndrome, and uh, this epilepsy with continuous spike wave sleep, the spike wave activity during sleep. This here, the indirectal epileptic form abnormalities get preferentially, markedly activated during sleep. The moral of the story is that in these kind of syndromes, if they are suspected, it's important to get an EEG during sleep also, because awake EEG may not provide you with all the information which are necessary. In temporal lobe epilepsy, again, the indirectal epileptic form abnormalities get more activated during the deeper stages of the non-REM sleep, while the seizures are occurring more frequently during the lighter stages, that means non-REM stage 1 and 2. Why this difference between indirectal and dictal is uncertain, but it may be largely related to the synchronization of the EEG activity, which is happening in a different way during different stages of the non-REM sleep. There are several few seizures which almost occur exclusively during sleep. One of them, as the name suggests, is, is nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy, a sporadic form of it you saw in the third video, but it, can, it is more often familial, and this is what you call autosomal dominant nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy. This is one of the epilepsy syndrome which has been clearly established to have a genetic background. Here it is related to a mutation of the acetylcholine receptor at chromosome M20 in majority of the patients, although there are certain other mutations are also documented. Similarly, only in almost 90% of the children with benign Rolandic epilepsy, the seizures are largely confined to sleep and they seldom get daytime seizures. Now, the other way around, the effect of epilepsy on sleep is also equally dramatic. The repeated episodes of seizures, whether they are partial, complex partial or generalized, occurring during night, as you can understand, can disrupt the nocturnal sleep. And similarly, even the seizures need not occur, either the electrographic seizures or interictal epileptiform abnormalities, there are a lot of studies available, which show that they can also disrupt the sleep architecture and can produce poor sleep. 
And because of these reasons, many of these patients will have what you call excessive daytime sleepiness or somnolence, which may be one of the major symptoms in patients with epilepsy. And few of them, because of that, these repeated episodes can have insomnia and nocturnal spells also will have to be differentially diagnosed. Now, it has been shown by the Epworth sleep scale that nearly one third of the patients, 30 to 50 percent of patients, persons with epilepsy would have daytime sleepiness. And this could be multifactorial. This may be related to the seizures occurring during night or indirect epileptiform abnormalities or an effect of sedative anti-epileptic drugs or may be due to the associated primary sleep disorders which can occur concurrently with epilepsy. We would see that this is, they are more prone to develop these associated sleep disorders because of various reasons which we will examine soon. In correction of the sleep disorders in these patients, as you know, sleep deprivation is one of the ways in which seizures can occur more frequently. So that by correcting the sleep problem in these patients can also improve the sleep control. So if you get a patient with poorly controlled epilepsy, in spite of the anti-epileptic medication, do not forget to ask about the nocturnal sleep because unless you take care of that, pumping in more anti-epileptic drugs may not have any influence on the seizure control and they may be diagnosed as having refractory epilepsy, but in fact they are pseudo-refractory because they are not being properly managed. Now the sleep disorders, uh, breathing disorders, especially the obstructive sleep apnea, occur more frequently in patients with epilepsy. As you know, valproid, one of the major side effects of valproid is a weight gain. Almost 30 to 50 percent of them can have weight gain related to valproid. That can worsen or by itself can precipitate sleep apnea. And similarly, in a patient with an obstructive sleep apnea, sedative medication like benzodiazepines and phenobarbitone can have detrimental effects. Vagus nerve stimulation for benefit of uh, the knowledge of especially students is a form of new form of treatment of refractory epilepsy which is not controlled by the medication by stimulating the vagus nerve through a pacemaker device. And this can again produce breathing disorders and uh, in a patient with sleep apnea it can sometimes aggravate the sleep apnea which should be remembered. And uh, restless leg syndrome which uh, briefly was discussed by Dr. Padma can be worsened by some of the anti-epileptic medications like phenytoin or sonisamide, but other drugs like gabapentin, valproate and benzodiazepines can have beneficial effect on the, on the restless leg syndrome. The, let's examine now what would be the influence of anti-epileptic drugs on sleep. Generally the effect is beneficial. This may be related to control of seizures or may be related to the, the suppression of the indirect epilepsy from abnormalities. The, the anti-epileptic drugs in general also prolongs the non-REM stage of sleep and decreases the REM sleep and the sudden withdrawal of that can also produce a REM rebound. And out of the drugs, valproate is the most beneficial and phenytoin, if it's an older generation of drug, is the least beneficial. But some of the anti-epileptic drugs like felbamate, lamotrigine and sonisamide and also produce insomnia, sometimes quite severe, and this has to be inquired and, the, and these drugs may have to be changed in those patients with uh, marked sleep disruption. Now with this background, now let us try to construct an algorithm in a patient who is presenting with the periodic events during sleep, how to approach these patients. As you know that the only way to establish the diagnosis is by means of a nocturnal polysomnography. But in a developing country like ours, the facilities are very few and also it's quite an expensive proposition. So it is better to select these patients for polysomnography that in whom clinically you can make a diagnosis and who would require a polysomnography in order to establish a diagnosis. So when a patient is presenting to you with the nocturnal spells predominantly, it should be careful history taking will say that whether there are any associated daytime events or no daytime events. In those patients who, whom the daytime events are present, in addition to the nocturnal events, the first investigation of choice would be to do a routine awake and sleep EEG. 
If that shows interictal epileptiform abnormalities, then the patient should be managed as epilepsy. And if there is no response, then you undertake a video EG monitoring. If the that interictal, if there are no interictal epileptiform abnormalities, then the monitoring, a long-term video EG monitoring, would be required. Suppose if the daytime events are absent and the and the events are exclusively during sleep then you will have to clinically decide whether these are more likely epileptic seizures or more likely to be parasomnias. How you do that will be shown in the next slides, but if you feel that it is more likely to be epileptic seizures, then you undertake an awake and sleep EEG, and if the indirectal epileptic form abnormalities are present, manage as epilepsy, otherwise you have to do a video EEG monitoring. And if you think that the Clinically, there are some useful points to distinguish between frontal lobe epilepsy and parasomnia because frontal lobe epilepsy is the one which more frequently presents with purely nocturnal events. The age usually if it's relatively young and the duration is short, like less than two minutes and the occurrence usually within about half an hour to one hour to going to sleep and if there is a predominant dystonic posturing as you saw in the second patient and perhaps the most important clue is if all the events are stereotyped then this is more in favor of an epileptic seizure and if there is a rapid regaining of the consciousness with a lucid recall that is more likely to be epilepsy on the other hand in most of parasomnias patients tend to become confused for several minutes after even the episodes are also over so that if there are, if the daytime events are absent, it's more likely to be parasomnia, then this patient will have to be monitored in a sleep center along with video EG and a polysomnography. If a combined procedure will have to be done in order to distinguish between the parasomnias and uh, whether there is any possibility of epileptic seizure still. Because patients with sometimes frontal lobe epilepsy may not have any, any interictal epileptic form abnormalities, and because of myogenic artifacts, ictal activity may be difficult to record. So, let me give you some take home messages. The interaction between sleep and epilepsy is bidirectional and it can be from simple to highly complex. The sleep is an activator in general of indirectal epileptic form discharges as well as epileptic seizures. The routine EEG in persons with suspected seizure disorder should always include a sleep recording. Awake recording alone may not establish a diagnosis. Sleep, sleep disruption due to various reasons can disturb the seizure control. Epileptic discharges can alter the sleep regulation and can provoke sleep disruption and uh, the obvious nocturnal epileptic events need not occur to do that. Excessive daytime sleepiness and insomnia in persons with epilepsy may not be always related to epilepsy but may indicate an underlying sleep disorder for which consultation may have to be sought. Differential diagnosis between nocturnal seizures and parasomnias often need a close interaction between a neurologist with interest in epilepsy as well as a sleep specialist. Thank you very much for your attention.